Okay, good morning everyone. Today is May 27th, 2017, and this is the John Chappelle Natural uh, Science Philosophy morning, Saturday morning science chat. And uh, we're just here to talk about all things related to science. So uh, I wanted to throw it out to you guys and see whether there was any topics of interest uh, that you wanted to discuss this week. I see we have Ian joining us today. So Ian, why don't you say a few things about yourself and what you're interested in? Well, it sounds like we don't, we can't hear you, Ian. Does anyone hear Ian? No, I think we're having a problem with uh, with Ian's uh, sound. It's like I was having a problem with my sound today. You may want to uh, exit the conference and when you come back in, click on the show settings and see whether your uh, microphone is working. I had to log back in again. This is Bill Lucas. Yeah, maybe everyone is having that problem this morning. You have to log back in in order to get your audio working. I'm all right. Ray Redburn. Well, who do we else do we have here today? Well, I see we have Cornelius. And uh, let's see, who else we got here today? We have uh, Harry's here with us. And Mitch and Ray. So I was wondering, uh, Harry, do you have any comments or topics that you would like to discuss this morning? I know that last time we were discussing uh, the magnetic field, and we could talk more about that. What's the status of the Glenn Baxter recordings? Well, the status is that uh, David was able to write a little program that basically sucked down all the links. Now, I haven't really checked to see whether all of that works. So, Harry, did you go and try and actually click on all the links? Because he did establish that new website on the CNPS website. Can you hear me? Okay, well, can you hear me now, Ian. You're kind of a little bit scratchy, but I think we can hear you. Uh, w w well, uh, Franklin, um, I've just removed my my um, headset. I, maybe the microphone is a problem there, so I'm going through the computer, the speakers on the computer. Um, just to comment on on what you've just said, um, I was in that um, website <clears throat> or the link that that um, David ha had. Uh, put in and the the links don't seem to be operating uh, and one more thing the, there's actually an address like john chappelle uh, slash baxter but if you go into the john chappelle homepage, you don't seem to be able to go directly to that link you know there's no link saying baxter uh, uh, legacy documents or something really let's see here let's take a look at that <clears throat> Well, frankly, I don't think we need to go into in detail. I think the bottom line is we don't think it's working, and uh, um, somebody probably should look into that. Um, you know, that's just my suggestion. Let's see here. First, uh, let's see here. So you have I, mean, I don't think we need to spend time now doing this. Okay, I don't think we need to spend time now going in and looking at this. Can't you do it later? Well, we can do that later, So, but I want to know if there's anything else uh, people want to talk about. So that is, uh, that is something that uh, we can continue looking into. 
because I think when I tested it out, like the, the one links, like I was just checking to see where the MP3 links would come down and it seemed to be okay. But did you have any science topics you wanted to uh, discuss? What's bothering you about <clears throat> physics? Well, Franklin, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll throw something out for discussion if you're interested. Um, this week, the America's Cup races start in Bermuda. And um, uh, there's been a lot of publicity about that. And um, I realized that in reading some of my stuff, I had read about the America's Cup in 1899 that Marconi, Guglielmo Mar Marconi, um, did the first commercially successful use of radio <clears throat> in uh, transmitting reports of the America's Cup races to presentations. And uh, it's kind of a significant historical event. Anyway, what I am doing out of um, my research was that um, in one of the uh, um, magazines uh, that was popular at the time, they proposed calling uh, Marconi's invention etheric telegraphy. That's it. Etheric. At the time, reading the newspapers and reading all the accounts at a particular time, everybody described the phenomenon as vibrations in the ether. So my question is, what happened to that idea of vibrations in the ether? Why did they go away? So you're saying that Marconi said that uh, there are vibrations in the ether. Well, if you look at the explanations that were given at the time, which I think are interesting, uh, the explanation given was that uh, the vibrations of the electricity on the wires um, induced vibrations in the ether just as the vibrations of a bell induced vibrations of air and that the uh, vibrations in the ether transmitted the vibrations of electricity on the transmitting antenna and induced vibrations in the receiving antenna. And so the question is, which I think is kind of interesting, that was the theory that was very popular, well, the accepted theory. I mean, nobody would even have thought of disagreeing with that idea at the time, but nowadays, that would seem to be uh, kind of a, nobody would believe that. So how did we go from believing in vibrations of the ether to now there's no ether at all? How do we explain radio waves if there's no vibrations in the ether? What was the time frame? Because I think that probably one of the main factors was the Michelson-Morley experiment which people think just proved the existence of the ether. And then as soon as that happened, then the ether seemed to have fallen out of favor. So was that experiment done, you know, after Marconi said that? No, it, it was done before, uh, but I think this is the point. It was 1887. And Harry has talked about an 1899 um, transmission and, um, you know, on all accounts, the ether was an accepted construct for, for what was actually happening um, with regard to the medium for carrying electromagnetic radiation. And now, paradoxically, I think it wasn't until um, the 1919 um, uh, eclipse expedition, uh, expeditions undertaken by Eddington uh, and the sort of uh, overnight uh, deification of, of Einstein. Um, now, th this, again, paradoxically was concerned with the general theory of relativity, which um, perhaps later on did reintroduce some form of ether. But it was really that, I think, that um, people said, oh, this guy's a genius, and he's uh, displaced 
earlier physics, classical physics, Newtonian physics, everything that went beforehand. And then they went back to the Michelson-Morley experiment and said, oh, well, that disproved the ether. Of course, um, uh, Michelson himself didn't think any such thing. So it was a bit of retrospective historicity, I think. That would be the way I, I might explain it. Well, I, I don't think it really had a whole lot to do with dis with disproving ether. I mean, that's basically the, the crux of it is whether or not it was ether that was carrying the waves or simply space time that's carrying the waves. And, you know, it, I think ether had just gotten so many different connotations as to what ether was composed of. Uh, it's more of the definition of, of what ether is. Even Einstein in 1920, you know, explained what he believed there was after not having even admitted that ether existed. So if you use, you know, the right definition, you can call space-time ether. Well, the question is, can we pin the demise of ether on Einstein? I, I think largely so. Um, there would be other factors as well, but I think largely so. And um, certainly, I think in... Um, undergraduate courses in physics, they they introduce, uh, you know, the special theory of relativity by sort of almost mocking uh, the concept of an ether as being sort of a medieval construct and, and not one which was uh, on all accounts held by serious scientists, um, you know, starting from 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 uh, Maxwell and uh, up uh, up until more modern times. I think it's perhaps the quote. Well, my view said that the ether was uh, superflu superfluous, which, which is not to say it is not there, it just it isn't, wasn't needed to do his calculations. But I think everyone took superfluous to mean doesn't exist. Well, Franklin, I think you're getting off topic here. I don't, I don't think that's the point. The point is um, the explanations of radio we call it now radio. In those days, they called it wireless. Okay. Um, the explanation of how it worked was that you had electric waves on the antenna, and the vibration of the electric waves on the antenna created vibrations in the ether. Okay. So to me, the fact that that worked okay, would be proof of the existence of ether, okay? That, to me, makes a lot of sense as a theory. That's how it was understood when they invented radio and wireless. And then after radio and wireless had been invented, um, they did away with the ether. So my question would be, um, would radio have been invented if it hadn't been for the concept of ether? Okay, that would be one point. And then the next point is, why isn't radio taken as proof of the existence of ether? I think there's a couple issues here as well that you got to be careful about. One is the definition of an ether. I thought they were dismissing a material ether, not ether in general. And then when quantum field theory came along, uh, with a lot of virtual particles and virtual field flex, uh, fluctuations, that is what they thought the ether was when they introduced this uh, quantum field theory. So I don't think they ever got rid of the ether. It's just not a material ether. Right, and, and in that respect, the same thing is true of Harry's statement. He's asking about you know, the radio wave transmission is still waves. It's more about whether it's waving in space time or waving in a non material ether, as you're saying, or waving in a more particular type ether. It's more about what it is waving in, but I don't think there's a dispute about it being electromagnetic waves. I, I think indeed the advent of the uh, quantum theory um, after the 1919. Um, eclipse expeditions did have something to do with this as well because previously um one had a difficulty in um looking at 
empty space, uh, space with, with nothing in it. And um, therefore, um, how, how, how could you actually transmit information through a varying electric and magnetic fields in, in nothingness? But I suppose with the photoelectric effect and the uh, quantum theory, you uh, were postulating particles, photons and, and actual particles. So you were sort of doing away with the necessity to have any material or quasi-material uh, in free space to be used as a medium of transmission. You actually had particles themselves, which were actually um, traveling at the speed of light and, and um, imparting the information from, from one aspect, one source to, to the receiver. And also, also I'd like to uh, say, I think the advent of radio uh, was more experimental than theoretical. And if I understand from what I've read, it was all experimentation that was going on. Yes, there was theory going on as well, but it was the experimentation aspect that really invented radio and not the theoretical. Well, I'd like to comment on that because I don't think that's, a, I, I kind of disagree with that. Um, the problem, what really happened was, I think the physicists sort of understood um, that what was happening was a vibration, okay, a vibration of the waves, if you will, um, and they were able to apply like uh, sound theory, um, theory of sound analogies. In other words, um, the the theory was really based on the theory of antennas was really based on the analogy of sound waves, okay, that were well known, uh, and the mathematics of that was well understood. Um, what Marconi did was he invented this antenna. And I don't think people really, you know, it's pretty well established in the literature at the time. But what he did was he invented what's called the vertical monopole antenna, in which he had a vertical wire uh, connected to one pole of the spark transmitter, and the other side of the spark transmitter was grounded. And up until he did that, um, they weren't really having very much success with getting transmission distances that were very far. And what he found was the taller he made the antenna, the vertical wire, the further the range of the transmitter. And that was really the breakthrough, the discovery of making an antenna that worked. Um, the theory of etheric waves was pretty well known because of the work of Maxwell and Hertz and a lot of other people who had really basically worked out the theory of waves. What they didn't have was a practical way of uh, making it work as um, a transmitting uh, system for uh, telegraphy. I agree Does with that makes you sense that, to you? Yeah, it makes sense, but notice what you said is that McConey experimentally was designing, uh, was making these antennas and he's finding that the taller the antenna, the, the further the transmission, not from theory necessarily. It sounded like you were saying from experimentation. Yes, there, there was theory around and theory being worked on. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me go back here. What was used before was what's called the Hertz antenna, which, which today we call a dipole antenna. And um, there were other aspects of it. So what you have here is a problem of technology. You also have the problem of the detector, the coherer detector. And um, essentially what you have is a technology trying to make the theory work. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? And at the time you had people, you know, there was a lot of confusion about, um, you know, what the theory ought to be as well as, um, you know, what the technology was that implemented that theory. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion about that. But the if you read the accounts, it's very clear that they understood the concept of vibration of electric waves on the antenna, exciting waves in the ether, and then those waves exciting electric waves in the receive antenna. Uh, 
think I understood some of that, but when you think of it, also another form of power transmission, and then Tesla worked on that, and he also had a different type of antenna where he was actually transmitting electrical power and not electromagnetic power, and therefore he was able to transmit electricity uh, wirelessly. So there's there's different types of waves that can move through this media. One indication, of course, of um, Marconi's departure from accepted theory at the time was um, his um, attempting to uh, transmit uh, radio signals across the Atlantic um, between um, Cornwall and Newfoundland, um, which accepted theory said was impossible because it wasn't a line of sight. Um, operation you had the curvature of the earth which was actually um you know going to stop the radio waves now marconi said well nevertheless he's, he's going to try it he wouldn't accept that that ruled out the possibility and he didn't know at the time uh, about the ionosphere but actually the ionosphere uh, gave the um bouncing of the um radiation and um I, I actually in order to explain that I, i've looked at this myself you have to um uh, except um, a phase velocity of, of light which exceeds uh, that in, in vacuum uh, in the initial layers of the ionosphere for, for it to have this total internal reflection system. But I mean, Marconi was proved right, and um, he was maybe just working on a gut feeling that it, it possibly would work, although the theories at the time, Lord Kelvin said it, it was impossible. Well, that's kind of one of the interesting things, you know, where, uh, you know, the theory didn't work out the way they thought it was going to. I think Marconi thought um, that basically, if you look at what he did was he made this really, really, really big antenna and this really, really, really powerful transmitter. And I think he thought that he could make power transmitted in the antenna big enough to get it done. So uh, I'm sharing a document here. Can you guys see that? There, the, someone's writing about what happened to the old ether here. And uh, so they do mention the uh, Michelson and Morley experiment as being one nail in the coffin there. But I'm, I'm just reading to see what else he's saying here. And the, like they're saying the ether wasn't totally Removed. But I think what, what was also mentioned significant is that when we started getting to quantum theory, we started to think of, of light as a particle. And if, it, if light or EM is a particle, then it doesn't require a medium in order to transmit it. So perhaps that is one of the other major... Well, then, that, then it's not a vibration, then, is it? No, it would not be a vibration. That's this whole... Uh, wave particle duality thing so if you can make a radio wave a particle then you no longer need an ether and i think people kind of forgot about the whole wave part of it and uh, just kind of blindly went with the uh, particle interpretation of, of electromagnetic phenomenon well, I think they still have the particles waving, though, as a thing. They don't have the particles just moving unidirectionally. There's still particles waving through through the media. Well, I would think that the overall overwhelming evidence is that electromagnetic phenomenon is a wave, and it probably is never a particle. But uh, nonetheless, getting back to Harry's point about why why is it that we uh, why why the ether came in such a you know, disrespect, right? So this paper goes on explaining that quantum theory uh, happened. And there's something about dark matter, but I don't know if that has anything to do with anything.
So it would seem that uh, this guy's paper is suggesting that uh, the Michelson Morley experiment and the introduction of quantum physics that the whole ether just fell aside. Hey, doesn't everybody know that dark matter? Well, that's very nice. Now, how do you explain electromagnetism and uh, radio waves? Well, of course, as an etherist, I explain it as ether. If I may just interject here, it might help in, in addressing those questions. Um, I was about to say at the beginning, uh, when I didn't have the sound, that I actually retired last month, so I think I have a bit more time to devote to maybe my, my first love. Um, but shortly before retirement, I was speaking to um, some uh, young engineer who was working on electromagnetic uh, compatibility. And he, he just finished a doctorate. And um, we, we just had lunch together, actually, because he just joined the, the committee, which I was leaving. And he told me that there were a number of academics, a number of professors who admitted to him privately that they believed in the ether. But they said it was as much as their careers were worth to make that known. So they, 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 they hid uh, that um, fact uh, from the general populace and from their employers so it, it was sort of like it's a it's a, a, a dirty secret you know uh, they 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 actually theoretically realized because of the analogy with other uh, forms of um, wave motion that you needed a medium but it was not politically correct to use a current term to um say that that is so in the case of electromagnetic radiation. So I thought that might be an interesting uh, sort of political type um, uh, element to, to this question. I hear the same thing from the retired professors that I know and talk to about Einstein's special theory of relativity. If you object to it in any way, your career is over. So these professors uh, emeritus now were telling me they only would speak out once they've retired from their tenured position, because otherwise they knew they would be ostracized, would not get funding, and would be ejected e effectively from academia. That goes to the uh, Ivor Cat complaint about uh, careerist and uh, the... Um, peer review system uh, that he's been uh, sending out a lot of emails recently. I don't know if any of you other people are on his email list, but he's been complaining about the peer review system and the suppression of, uh, of uh, ideas that uh, the peer review system lends itself to, which essentially boils down to a sort of imposition of political correctness. But I think that's a problem of of the sociology of science. I'm not sure we're addressing that here. So my response to Ian's comment would be um, that people realize that the theory that is being promoted in the textbooks doesn't really make much sense in terms of, uh, of a physical explanation, but they really don't feel that um, it's worth their while to talk about it because uh, it's uh, suppressed discussion. Well, I think isn't it more, if you look at a textbook that they would just explain radio waves, you know, as being a, uh, like they'll just draw like a sine wave on the page and they'll show it coming out of the transmitter and be received by a receiver. And but they just never mention how that works. Right. That's correct. And um, I have a little story to tell about this. Um, uh, I worked as electrical engineer for many, many, many years and um, for a well-known satellite communications company. And um, I was sitting around one time in a social gathering talking with some fairly, you know, high up level engineers in the company. And uh, I was talking about um, propagation of radio waves and this one guy was telling me that the, uh, well, it was clearly explained in the physics books that the electric field creates the magnetic field and the magnetic field creates the magnetic field and um, in a progressive wave. 
And I said, but that's not what it shows in the physics books. The physics books show the electric field and the magnetic field in phase, not out of phase. And he looked at me with a stunned look because, you know, he had been believing this for so long and he never thought about what the pictures were telling him. He just assumed that the text and the pictures, uh, you know, said the same thing, but they don't. Well, I mean, that whole picture of radio waves being of time varying magnetic and electromagnetic wave. I mean, I think that just confused things further. That was a uh, concept from Maxwell, wasn't it? Who came up with that concept? Um, I suppose we could attribute it to Maxwell. Um, I, I'm not. You know, that, that this is kind of like a side issue. Um, the point being that if the electric field, the, the curl equation say that, you know, the um, curl of the electric field is the time derivative of the magnetic field and the curl of the magnetic field is the time derivative of the electric field, but that's not exactly correct. It's actually um, the magnetic um, because the quantity, the fields are not the same. The, the electric field is not created by the magnetic field. It's created by the change of the magnetic induction. And the magnetic field is not created by a change in the magnetic field. It's created by the change in the electric induction. And those are two, the electric field and the induction are two different things. And so they confuse that. So that's just another point of confusion. But um, the fields in all the drawings are in phase, so one can't create the other because in order to do that, they'd have to be out of phase if you go by the curl equations. Do you understand this? Yes, I understand that. And I've pointed this out to some of my physics professors that I had years and years ago. And they agreed they're you know scratching their head that there seems to be something off if you try to explain it as the electric field generating the magnetic field the magnetic field time varying magnetic field creates the electric field and the drawings that show everything in phase everything should be out of phase by 90 degrees and if you, i isn't there the pointing vector is uh like a dot product of the electric and the magnetic? The cross product, E cross product. Right. Yeah. So I'm thinking, where's the energy in that diagram? Does the energy go to zero at the nodes? It would have to. The energy, the energy can vary with time if, if the electric field and the magnetic field are in phase. So you don't have a problem with the pointing vector if the fields are in phase. You do have a problem if they're out of phase. Interesting. Anyway, I'm not sure that I would agree with the electric field being generated by time varying magnetic field, etc. Not from a source point of view. The actual source of everything are these changing uh, electric sources, the electron, proton. Uh, um, I find it odd in classical electrodynamics that they can detach apparently from the actual primary sources and then have these changing magnetic fields generate an electric field, electric field changing an electric field generating a magnetic field and a propagation that way seemingly detach from the original sources. I find that very odd. I think that points to the need for some kind of vibrating medium. So I think perhaps another reason for the demise of the ether is that uh, no one's been able to find it. Well, that that's not exactly true. <laughs> the uh, uh, Arthur Compton and uh, uh, his last graduate student Winston Bostick uh, were able to show that uh, all particles like elementary particles and things of that sort 
are standing waves in the electromagnetic field. And the electromagnetic field is the ether, but it doesn't consist of matter. It consists of, uh, in the vacuum at least, it consists of just the fields. But if there are standing waves in the field, they have the properties that we assign to electrons, protons, and other elementary particles, which includes mass and spin, charge, and stuff like that. And what Wait, is I'm... very interesting to me, I'm a historian, and um, uh, the according to the Greeks, the very first natural philosopher was Moses, or they call it Mokus in, in Greek. And uh, they uh, uh, tell that in his approach, the uh, you have the power of God being uh, exerted by fields that come out from, from him. And then you have these monads formed in the field. And uh, it was, wasn't until Winston Bostick did his experiments where he took the field and formed uh, toroidal rings in it that we got a physical type of uh, description of the, of the uh, standing waves or solitons in the field. And so if you take this approach, then the ether is different from ethers that consist of uh, particles or something else. And by the way, this was taught in all the major universities up until 1900. And in, when the Encyclopedia was, uh, Botanica was bought, the new owner took all of that information out. So if you get the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, before 1910, you get it, all that's in there. But if you get it after the 1910, it's all removed. And uh, they've removed it also from the curriculum of all the major universities. Uh, but people like uh, Maxwell, Faraday, Ampere, they all studied that when they went to school. And uh, even Isaac Newton studied it. And it's in his, uh, some of his books, he talks about it. And uh, so it's interesting what has happened is as different groups have gained control in the scientific field for one reason or another, they eliminate their competition and, and they don't allow it to be uh, taught and they don't allow it to be put in articles for journals and they don't uh, uh, acknowledge it exists. And, and that's why we have the postmodern philosophy of science with these silos for each field so they can control that. And if you're not involved in the politics of science, you will uh, not see that too well. But uh, uh, for instance, when I gave my first paper showing that on the basis of logic, uh, the special theory of relativity is falsified because it uses five different assumptions that are known by experiment to be false. But in the postmodern philosophy of science that we have today, which came into effect in the 1960s, uh, you're not allowed to falsify any theory on the basis of logic, only experimental results that don't agree with predictions of the theory. None, if, if you, false, you can't falsify a theory because its assumptions are known to be false. And uh, that's crazy. But that's, that's what's happening. We're, we have a lot of uh, special interest groups that are um, taking an interest in science and trying to control it, just like they try to control politics and governments and all kinds of things like that. It seems to be common throughout all disciplines. Even medicine and pharmaceutical industry, they have the same problems. Well, uh, Bob, I, uh, Bill, I'm not really, I don't really object. I think... Um, you know, the real issue to, to a certain extent is this idea of what is scientific method. And, um, you know, I think that you bring up this every time you talk about this, you know, I'm 100% in agreement with you. And, um, you know, they give this uh, talk when they talk about scientific method, the way, what they actually practice isn't really that what they, um, you know, the way they really do it isn't really what they say they're doing. Um, and I think the whole method is, is seriously flawed. Um, 
uh, in this case, I, you know, that we're talking about, um, you know, I, it seems to me that, you know, there's not only contradictions in logic, uh, but there's uh, contradictions in the factual basis of, uh, of, you know, the explanation of electromagnetic waves. And, you know, to me, I was just struck. I mean, I, I, my point and the reason I bring this up was I was somewhat astounded by these explanations in newspapers. Okay. At the time, people were, um, the reporters in newspapers were explaining how wireless telegraphy worked. They were explaining Marconi's invention. And I was struck by how exceedingly understandable these explanations were relative to the obscure and ununderstandable explanations in today's current physics textbooks. Yeah, it's also interesting if you look at the work of Ampere and Faraday, whenever they talk about what we call the field today, they call it the, the spirit of God based on all this stuff going all the way back to Moses. But you don't see that in the, in the you go on, on the internet and you look and you don't see them. You, you look at what they had to say and, you, and they've taken the word spirit out. They put in the word field, but they didn't use that word. They use the word spirit. And uh, so uh, that is uh, what I find is uh, very misleading. And, uh, uh, but anyway, if you have a, if the electromagnetic field is the source of all matter, because all matter is uh, produced by standing waves called solitons uh, in the um, electromagnetic field, then when you try to do an experiment like the Michelson-Morley experiment, you don't have an ether passing by the Earth or the Earth going through an ether. The Earth is part of the ether, and so. Uh, you have uh, uh, what I'd call local and long distance effects. And so when you're close to the earth and you're performing experiments, you don't see any effect of the ether, but uh, you only see it on, on a larger scale. And that's, that also accounts for why uh, we have the force of inertia and uh, for the uh, uh, various... Uh, effects that Einstein was trying to explain, like Mach's, uh, 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 I can't think of the name of it, sorry. Uh, Mach had the idea Prin that, pardon? Pr Prin principle, I think you mean, do you, Bill? Mach's Mach principle, yeah. And uh, Einstein talked about it, but he never could satisfy it with his theories. And uh, the, uh, the idea is that uh, if there's structure to the universe, if it's not uh, isotropic and homogeneous, then you're going to have some effect due to the structure of the universe. And it's going to affect the force of inertia. It's going to affect um, gravity and uh, all of these uh, things. And uh, that's what uh, we see. But when you look at like both special relativity and general relativity, they assume that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. But we don't observe that. When we look at our solar system, it's not homogeneous and isotropic. It's got a center and it's got uh, planets going around the center and it's got moons going around the planets. You look at the Milky Way galaxy, it's got spiral arms and it's got a center. And then you look with various techniques at the overall structure of the universe and you find it appears to have a center also. But we don't falsify any of these theories because their assumptions are don't don't agree with observation. We uh, Bill, Bill, what is homogeneous and isotropic is not the universe. What's homogeneous and isotropic is the ether before it begins to wave. Now, getting to this whole topic of waves. So you know, I uh, I, I I seriously reject uh, Bill's notion that uh, the electromagnetic field is fundamental. And the reason why I do that is because if it is a wave, and I think quite clearly, as Harry points out, it does appear to be a compression-type wave, 
that is going through, that seems to be the easiest and most straightforward explanation, uh, those types of phenomenon definitely require a particulate medium. I don't see how you can get the physical properties of a wave without a particulate medium. So that this is the reason why I reject uh, the hypothesis that the uh, that space itself uh, has the electromagnetic field as a fundamental thing. Well, the the work of Arthur Compton and his last graduate student Winston Bostic um, showed that the field is the fundamental thing, and particles are structures in the field, and. Uh, uh, yeah. and and that agrees with our accelerator experiments. And, I mean, uh, always talk about logic, right? Pardon? We always talk about logic, but doesn't, I mean, this is why I object to that theory. Because I don't care what, what those guys did. I don't care what they said. Logic well, tells me. They're, they're, their right. ideas are Franklin, based on the experiments. Thing the thing you're overlooking, Franklin, is that the field, the, the field is basically a tension field. And you're concerned about compression, and you're trying to use it as a fluid. And it's a tension field, it's solid. You can have waves in a tension field without particles. And I'm on the road, so I'm not going to make any further comments. <laughs> well, once again, I would object to that on the same basis, that in order to create tension, once again, there has to be a particulate medium in order to represent that tension. Tension... And, and, that, and, that, and that needs to be corrected. That, that thinking needs to be corrected. And like I said, I'm not in a position to talk about that right now. Uh, if you guys want to continue along those lines and think about it, fine. I'm on a road trip and I have to uh, kind of just listen in the background. Yeah, well, you know, to my thinking... Thank you, if, Cornelius. If I apply what I feel is the correct logic to these things, I mean, all these concepts we know from things which are particulate, like, you know, tension, uh, sound waves. We all know that all those phenomena arise from particulate media. We know that for a scientific fact. So it only makes logical sense that if there's a radio wave, that that should also arise in a particulate medium, and that it is, and that the radio wave itself is not fundamental. That, that would be my, my explaining of my logic. As Bill said, what, what the point Bill is trying to make is that all waves, or all particles, basically originate as patterns of waves. And my point is, all waves originate as patterns of particles. Right. Well, uh, William Hooper, who did a lot of uh, very fundamental experiments on electric magnetic fields, um, he was able to show that the electric and magnetic fields have a tensile strength. And so there, uh, that, that strength can be measured, and he gives all the experiments he used for measuring it. And he wasn't a dummy. He went to University of California at Berkeley. He was a good student there. <laughs> and uh, he published uh, a book on gravity and electrodynamics. Uh, and uh, which I'm about to release a new public, a new version of as this copyright expires because no one is promoting his book, but I don't want to be yeah. sued until the copyright's over. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, the, the, he, he indicated that experimentally you can prove that there's a tensile strength to the field. We don't have to have any charges or particles at all, just the yeah. field. Tensile strength is exactly what I'm talking about too, Bill, right? I agree with that totally. It's, it's a tension field. But well, once again, tensile strength is a property of things that are continuously made out of matter, like you talk about. No, tensile, ten, tensile strength is what is between the particles. Now, tensile strength is like the tensile strength of a steel wire. So you pull on it, and it pulls back. And that wire is made out of particulate matter. Right. And what's, what's pulling between the tension? What's the tension between the particles created by? That's that's the that is the substance that is the foundation of all the particles. Is the tension that is created between the particles is also the particles. No, I completely reject that idea as well. I mean, we're talking about.
things which you would ultimately seem completely different. I mean, he's talking about tension, which is a, 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 a force between particles pulling them or pushing them together. Now, you're saying that that is actually matter, which, which to me, it completely blows my mind. It's like, what? That's like, that doesn't make, you know. That's I'm matter. not saying that's actually matter. I'm saying that the tension patterns create the properties of matter. Matter, um, excuse, excuse me, guys. Matter. I'm gonna I'm gonna sign out. This is Harry Ricker. I'm gonna sign out. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Harry. Thanks, Harry. Start. Thanks for starting the conversation. The if you ask the question, what causes tension between particles or atoms or stuff like that that keeps them together, it's the field. It's it's not the particles. It's the field that's causing the tension. And if you ask what, what produces the Coulomb force, it's the field. Yep. 100% correct. I 100% yes. agree with that. Sugar, sugar. Yep. Anything else? That should do it. The, the analogy of the tension in the case of um, electromagnetic radiation is the dielectric constant. Now, we can start arguing uh, a bit like chicken and egg, which came first. Um, you know the particles or, or or the waves, but I mean th that is that is the analogy, and the analogy for the grossness or the the density of of the uh, of of the um, ponderable matter, if you like, in the case of electromagnetic radiation, would be the the magnetic permeability. That's right. Per per permeability and permittivity is equivalently to uh, stress and strain in a in a, in a uh tangible media. And what causes permittivity and permeability? It's the nature of the media, the nature of the universe, the nature of the ether. It's. I mean, permittivity and permeability vary from material to material. It's not That's correct. zero yeah. in that. That's correct. Uh, do as do Young's modulus and the density vary from material to material correct and 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 the density of the ether, of the tension the strength of the tension varies from material to material because the tension is what creates the material in the first place it's the density of the tension that makes us identify something as material if there's an extremely large amount of tension variance in a particular area of space we identify that as a particle well that doesn't make I, I disagree with that because, like, if I take a string wire, like on my violin, and I put it under a great deal of tension, it doesn't turn into anything else, and I would not expect it to. But it does vibrate at a different frequency. Yes, it does vibrate at different frequencies, but it doesn't turn into, like, it doesn't transmute into anything. And, and if you change the tension in the gravitational field, light travels at a different speed. Yeah. But I, once again, I can see that happening, but I don't see it becoming a. That's, that's essentially because you need to understand the behavior of the tension, of tension in a solid. And you, if you understand the behavior of the tension in a solid, solid, and how that tension becomes self-closing, it becomes uh, particle patterns, then you'll understand where the particles arise from. But you have to study the tension. You have to study the interactive behavior of tension densities. Well, tension only has to do with density, and that means the regions of either lower or higher density. Now, there's no way I can conceive of. I didn't speak of ten. I didn't speak of molecular density. I spoke of tension density, the intensity of the tension. Well, tension, though, fundamentally causes uh, a compression or a rarefication of whatever medium you happen to be in. That's what is normally meant by tension, like tension yeah. on a. Right. And, and I guess that, that's what I mean, I'm going to have to just really sign off and listen. Uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe we can continue this conversation or, or Bill can help carry it on. Uh, but there's definitely specific behaviors of tension within a solid media that can demonstrate the characteristics of a tension that can create patterns that are focused, patterns that are like light, patterns that are like neutrons, patterns that are like electrons. Those patterns, those characteristics can come out of all different sorts of patterns of tension. And from that, we can 
we can uh, get the emergence of matter, but uh, I really can't go on and I should, so I'm just going to listen. Now, there have been some discussions in the email chains lately that we've been discussing the nature of space. Now, some people, uh, they want to to say that there's a uh, somethingness, I guess, as it's described. I think, you know, Ian, you've been uh, active in these discussions, that you want there to be space to be made out of a somethingness. Um, so that you can stick a ruler in it and like measure it. You know, the, the, the discussion uh, revolves around, you know, what is space and what is nothingness? So uh, some people are saying that, you know, space is not nothingness, it's this somethingness, but uh, they don't exactly explain uh, what that somethingness is. Now, the, the funny thing is that when I propose what that somethingness is, and in my own pet theories, uh, that's just a positron electron dipole phi. So I put that in there. Uh, but even when I put that in there, they'll agree, okay, that might exist. But below that, between the spaces between these positron electron particles, there's still another space that exists, which is, which is even finer and denser than that space. And I go, why? Why do you need that? Um, well, because you have your electron positron particles being attracted together through nothingness. And that doesn't make sense either, does it? Uh, well, I explained that, which is that uh, you have to understand, first of all, how a positron and electron attract. Because if you don't understand that, then you can't say what it's going to do if, say, positron and electron are, say, right next to each other with nothing but void between them. Now, I would say, because the thing is, is that in my own pet theories, that when the positron and electron are right next to each other with nothing between them, uh, they don't attract. They're just sitting right next to each other like two peas. And uh, the only reason why they stay together is because that's just the equilibrium uh, position for them to be in because uh, they're, they're, they have to be uh, resonating and one of them has to basically be getting bigger while the other one's getting smaller. And so the only comfortable place for the electron to be in equilibrium is to be next to a positron. So it, it kind of absorbs the, 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 the resonance from the other particle. So the, it would make sense that when a positron and electron are right next to each other, there is no force. And they're only held there because as a, as a geometric argument. 15% there. But it's just strange that, you know, people uh, still want to have another physical space beyond uh, a, a space described by, like, a positive electron. Well, I think most of those people don't have an electron positron filled space, just like Bill. Uh, it says there is no structure to space. You need the book. This? book. Think. See, this is the problem. That logically, if I can fill space with a material substance, then that satisfies my logic that says that waves need a material, a particulate medium in order to create waves. So, to me, the field has to be made out of something by logic. Well, logic says that the f the field uh, meets all your criteria, meets all the criteria you need. It has tensile strength, and uh, it uh, is able to hold things together. When when one uses uh, uh, an electron or proton microscope and looks at an atom, and you see the individual electrons and they don't touch the nucleus and you you wonder well what keeps them apart but what keeps them uh, uh, together in terms of being bound in in an atom and uh the the concept of the field uh we have both electric and magnetic fields you can have a balance in the fields 
such that a structure, which we call an electron, uh, will both uh, attract and repel. And oh, so it can have an equilibrium. I'm not, I'm, not dis I'm not debating whether fields exist. What I'm debating is that by logic, Bill, doesn't logic demand that the field be made of a particulate matter? No, no. In fact, logic, the, the, way I, the way Isaac Newton said we were supposed to use logic, which is called the axiomatic method in science, is that you perform experiments, and you, uh, from those experiments, you get what are called empirical laws, which is the way you summarize the results of all your experiments in a certain uh, number of laws. And Newton said you should use the complete set of these laws in a field like electrodynamics and then by, uh, try to solve all of them together simultaneously to obtain the most general solution. And when you do that, uh, you obtain uh, some very interesting results. And uh, uh, that's what I did with uh, the six empirical laws of, of electrodynamics. And uh, I was able to obtain expressions for the field and the forces, electromagnetic forces, that have quantum effects and relativistic effects, but no quantum theory and no relativity theory, just electrodynamics. And so, uh, and then logic also says that each fundamental theory, like electrodynamics, which has a fundamental constant like C, can only one fundamental theory can have C as a fundamental constant. You can't have one in quantum mechanics, you can't have one in special relativity or general relativity, and so if you can only have one, the question is, which one is the right one to, to be the origin of C? And so what my work showed was that if you use electrodynamics as the fundamental theory, then these other theories are uh, completely uh, predictable. In fact, uh, I was able to derive the force of gravity and the force of inertia directly from electrodynamics just considering the average force between vibrating uh, neutral multipoles, like uh, electrons and protons uh, in, in atoms and things of that sort. And uh, so that was very interesting because I obtained the result of uh, special uh, general relativity theory and, and Newton's universal law of gravitation, but I obtained a second term, and that second term sh uh, shows us that we didn't need to invent dark matter and dark energy it's already in the theory of gravity. And uh, oh, I don't think that logic really even says all of that. I mean, what you just described sounds an awful lot like what you were objecting to in modern science, which is that things can only be refuted uh, by uh, em empirically uh, experiments. And when you no, no, that's, that's, not, that's not what uh, um, uh, logic says. You can, you can show that you can't have two theories using the same fundamental constant. And no, I actually don't think logic even says that. There's a whole field of science. It's called meta theory. And most people have never heard of it. And most of you haven't read any books about it. Henri Poincaré was the originator of the field of meta theory. And there's such strong opposition to his work that his books on meta theory are not allowed to be seen in any library of the world. They're held under lock and key. No one can see them. I went to University of Maryland. They have it. But they said no one can see it, not even the chairman of the physics department or any faculty members, that they're not allowed to show it to anyone. And that's what the head librarian told me. And well, it's been that way for 50 back. years. Let's get back to this fundamental question, which is, uh, like, say, my claim is that in order to have a field, that it must be made out of particulate matter. Now, my, my reasoning in this, now, I'm not going to use the word logic. I'm going to use the word for this, is that we will often uh, explain things by the way of analogy. So by the way of analogy, we know that sound waves, I mean, it, it, at some point it was mysterious why sound waves would travel through the air. 
But eventually, science figured that out, that it is due to a compression wave of uh, atoms which are in the air. So I think we had conclusively proved that the, uh, the, the perfectly transparent stuff in front of our face that we can wave our hands through is actually filled with atoms. And it is those atoms which are compressing and rarefying which allow us to transmit sound. And we can transmit and we can receive those through microphones and speakers. We can clearly see those as vibrations. So, as, as, as Harry pointed out, we see that exact same phenomenon in radio waves. So, by way of analogy, if I take my, my room and I completely remove all the oxygen or gas atoms out of there, and I can still transmit something which clearly acts as a wave, I think it, by, by analogy, we must conclude that there is still a medium like the air in that space because we know that particulate mediums can reproduce that physical behavior. So therefore... Tension, tension cannot be propagated by atoms or any other particular media. Ten, tension can only be propagated by a field. And those fields have to be made out of particulate matter, which is my point. It's like no, because you're just saying look, I just park. Particles cannot propagate tension. Tension requires a field. There has to be a field between particles to propagate tension. And in order for there to be a field, there must be particles. Is the other... Because particles cannot propagate tension. Particles cannot explain action at a distance or force at a distance. You have to have a field to do that. Uh, no, actually, see, the fields don't explain the force at a distance either. Yes, if they do. Because the tension of the field. It produces that effect. The thing is, if the field was made out of particles, that would explain force at a distance because that means there would be no force at a distance. Every single force we see observes because one particle hitting the next. But the work of Winston Bostick shows that the field is more fundamental than the particle because they were able to make particles out of fields, not the other way around. And that work, I, I would assert, is wrong. And, and particles, the fact that they have a wavelength associated with them shows that there's something field-like about the particle. Now, I would assert that that assertion is especially wrong. Well, we've given Nobel Prizes to people for that. Uh, yes, and I believe we've given Nobel Prizes to a lot of really, really wrong concepts, that being... It's not denied in any... That uh, scientific uh, work that I know of that particles don't have a wavelength associated with them. Yes, and that is one of the main, I mean, we don't understand in mainstream what gravity is or charge is either. Oh, but I do. In my work, I've published their, their properties of the electromagnetic structure of soliton. Well, you have, but mainstream hasn't. So I'm just saying that if you don't know what those two things are, how can you say anything about anything, pretty much? Well, what, what historically, for over 3,000 years, <laughs> the work that I'm doing was the going theory. 3,000 years. And it was discarded with the uh, development of what's called naturalism, which was an attempt to remove any explanation of nature that involves God. Yeah, but what I'm objecting to is that your conclusions are not reasonable. Your conclusion that the field is fundamental is not reasonable. It's experimentally confirmed. No, the only thing that's experimentally confirmed is that fields exist. And once again, I'm not objecting to the fact that fields exist. What I'm objecting to is that the fields don't consist of anything material. That is what I object to. That's right. They, they don't, don't consist. consist of anything material. And that That's is correct. right. It is not reasonable that they don't consist of any material. Because if they don't consist of any material, then they are incapable of having the properties of a field. Well, li listen to what the, the uh, natural philosophers uh, in 
Greece and in India had to say about this topic. They said that all, all uh, matter was composed of monads, and it was the structure of the monad that gave all the physical properties to matter, both its charge, its uh, mass, uh, and those color, all those types of properties are determined by the monad structure. But the monad has none of those properties. It's a, just a standing wave in oh, the field. It doesn't would, have a charge. It doesn't have mass. It doesn't have any of those things. I would agree with all of that, although I would extend it to say that uh, not only uh, are particles made out of monads, but space itself is made out of monads. So you just take that one little extension and say that space itself is filled with monads, then you would get to a more reasonable theory to say that the fields are made out of monads. But when, when Winston Bostick made monads, they wanted to combine with something. <coughs> they would not stay separate. They would form a structure. And the, the, um, <clears throat> When you look at the electromagnetic field, you know, it's a soliton. You can see it with various types of uh, experiments. You can actually see the soliton in the field. And uh, uh, you can see it's a, uh, a standing wave, a very uh, long-term standing wave. And you find that uh, in water and other fluids, which the electromagnetic force is controlling, you find that you can make these same structures there. And uh, <clears throat> so it's a, it's a uh, consistency between fluid dynamics and electrodynamics, and it gives a, a particular well, interpretation. It, in order there to be a consistency between fluid dynamics, which we know between water and air, and electrodynamics, then we would have to make electrodynamics have the equivalent of a particulate medium that we see in fluid dynamics. No, in fluid dynamics, the properties of the fluid are controlled by the fields between the particles. That's, that's why I don't really consider a fluid dynamics a proper model for the field either. That's why the field is actually a continuous solid. I consider the field to be much more like Einstein, like Einstein described the ether, uh, and I don't have monads within the, uh, the field. The field is a continuous tension field without any monads. Right. Well, the monads are, are particular uh, structures that you, when you disturb the field, you can create monads. Just like when you disturb the field, you can create an electron-positron pair, Right. Yeah, I know, which, yeah, doesn't, I know. which wasn't know. there before. I think right. that's where there's room for discussion between your theory and my theory, probably, Bill. Uh-huh. And so... Well, I think it's good to make the discussion because it sharpens us all. Well, I think both of your theories are not correct. And I think they're not correct because you cannot answer the question of how can you have a wave phenomenon, which clearly exists, without a particulate medium? Uh, basically, you know, you, can't, like, you cannot define how tension occurs without, without, with particles. So that's, a, that's where it really begins. It's, there's no way there can be attraction between two particles without something tensioning between them, which would have to be something tensioning between that, which would have to be something tensioning between that. Ultimately, what you get is just a tension field. And that's what you come down to, is there's nothing there but a field, and all particles and everything has to be a structure of the field. And now, let's talk about the field in particular. Let's talk about the physical phenomenon of a wave. So, Bill, how can you conceive of having a wave without a particulate medium in there somehow. How can you have a wave? The, uh, we, in a laboratory, we can make a wave. We can see the wave, the electromagnetic wave. And, and Winston Bostick was able to show how to make a toroidal ring directly not, out. And he could make it any size he wanted. And not, uh, that ring was stronger than any known pro, uh, elementary not, particle, atom, or material. And it, in other words, it was, it was indestructible by most means that we have. He put it in reactors and all kinds of things to see how strong that toroidal ring was. And he, that's why he 
he yeah. said that this is the only thing that could possibly be the building blocks of elementary particles and uh, all, all matter. And you haven't seen it, I don't believe, but uh, I published in an international Spanish conference in the Canary Islands uh, a theory explaining the structure of all the known elementary particles. Now, Bill, I, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but I just asked you a question and you didn't answer it. The question was, how can you conceive of a wave phenomenon without a particulate medium? Now, I don't want you to go off and talk about Okay, well, th we don't know of any particulate medium that doesn't involve fields. A wave, a wave on is field. simply a gradient. A Bill, gradient is simply a gradient in the field, so a wave would be a, gra a gradient in the tension. And a, a varying gradient constitutes a wave. So if you have a varying tension, then you have a wave. Without fields, you would have all your particles would be like billiard balls. <laughs> You're you know, not they're hard. The they don't have any wave action at a distance. But all media that have waves have action at a distance. Uh, no, sound waves don't have any action. At they a certainly do. <laughs> they do not. What do you think makes the molecules move in the wave pattern? It's the gradients of the fields that cause that. Uh, no, that would be the particles bashing into each other by uh, ordinary Newtonian collisions. If you have air, do you think the actual atoms touch one another? I don't. Well, they are certainly colliding into each other. They're coming near, and then the electromagnetic force field separates them. They don't actually touch. And well, it's that yeah, tension yeah. between oh. the molecules of the air that call, that allows waves, sound waves, and other phenomena. Well, you can get a ball pit, and quite clearly the balls are touching, and you can get a wave phenomenon to go through that. That is the way that works. And when you have two billiard balls, you know, they don't actually touch. <laughs> well, no, They actually look like they do. But if you look at it with a microscope, you'll see they don't actually touch. Now, I would actually disagree with that conception. First of all, I think that is probably one of the main wrong things about how we see matter. I was discussing this, like, what is an electron, you know? And uh, so I claim that an electron is basically the same thing as, say, a marble. If you took a marble, you know, you can hold it in your hand. It takes a finite amount of space. You cannot stick your finger into it. It has an impenetrable surface. And if you kept on cutting that marble up until you, cut, until you got to one electron, I would say that that electron would still have all those properties. And when you stuck two electrons together, the only reason why they don't merge together is because it's, you can't, for the same reason, you cannot stick two marbles together because they have a surface and they just stop right there. But the electrons in an atom don't touch one another. No, I would just When we take a picture of the atom, we can see them and they don't touch. Now, touching would also be another, because, because they have fields, those fields repel. It makes it very difficult for if they did have a solid surface for them to get close enough to touch. Now, really, the only times when I think they, they, they do actually touch is in the case of, let's say, a bare positron and bare electron. And there'd be nothing between them. It would be really the only instance where the, the field really doesn't interact. The, the forces between them really don't interact. But, you know, you still haven't answered my question, which is how can you have a wave without a particulate medium to represent the Compression, because wave is, pr is primarily a density effect. It's either a region where they have more particles or a region of less particles. Well, now, the question is, what? how can you change the density if you don't can't have any tensile strength forces that are based on fields? And the answer is you can't. Sure you can. I can have a billiard ball table, and I can fill it with either 10 balls 
or I can fill it with 100 balls. That changes the density. Now I can go and I can alternatively suck the balls out so that there's only 10 and then put the other 100 back in and it's 100. So that's changing the density and there's no fields involved. There's no concept of field necessary there. It's just a concept well, You of haven't looked at the microscopic level of atoms. They have fields and those fields cause them to stay apart unless they're forming a molecule. And once again, I have no objection to that. I'm not denying, you keep on, you keep on seeing. Okay, you, your that. electron has a charge. A charge is associated with a field. There's no other way we know. So, yes. but you're denying fields and fields. No, I'm, see, this is the thing, I am not denying fields. See, I keep on telling you that I'm not denying fields. That's what I'm denying is that fields are not made out of particulate matter. I'm saying that the fields must be made out of a particulate matter and that that field must be made out of the particulate matter of what we call the ether. So there must be a particulate matter that exists in, in you know, what we normally call vacuum space. That well, remember for over the first 3000 years, <laughs> fields were considered the spirit of God and that all matter was basically made of monads or what, what uh, Winston Bosick would call a soliton. And those solitons, they uh, uh, could combine to form various elementary particles. And I have shown in my work how to form all of the known elementary particles, including all their decay modes and their mass and their various properties, their total charge. And uh, that is something that the standard model of elementary particles cannot do. And as far as I know, there is no other complete explanation for that. But your explanation is not complete because you cannot explain, you know, how a radio wave works. Right? Sure, I can explain that. Then explain it. Okay. Everywhere in the universe, there's an electromagnetic field. What you do with a radio wave is you disturb that field and it propagates as a wave. You disturb field. that field. What is a disturbance in the field? What is a disturbance? Well, what, what do you do to an antenna to make something leave? You move charges on it. And the motion of those charges is what creates a, uh, a ripple in the field. And what's a ripple? A ripple is a wave in the field. The field has tensile strength. It has no problem having a wave. If what it has it? tensile strength, it has waves. And what is a wave? A wave is is uh, where the field changes its uh, intensity. Which is? Let's, let's look at the simple. Uh, like you were talking about a violin string earlier. No, don't don't interrupt, please. I'm trying to talk to this bill. No, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm speaking not, to the wave. Don't interrupt. Okay, please don't interrupt. Please don't interrupt. I'm talking with Bill, okay? Okay, when we measure electric and magnetic fields, uh, we I use can, a probe. Gonna... We use a probe and we can measure the intensity I'm, of the field. I'm not asking you how you measure it. I mean, you're saying that there's a changing intensity. Well, that's what we measure. That's what we see in experiments. If you want to throw out all experiments, we can do that. But then where are we going to be? No, but in order to measure an intensity, I mean, what, I mean, physically, how does that eventually end up in our instruments? In, in a, uh, like a, uh, uh, like a voltage or something, right? And ultimately, what is a voltage? I have a meter that can measure electromagnetic fields, and it doesn't require any wires to be attached or anything. Let's do a th simple thought experiment, which would. Can I, can I uh, address this for a moment as far as what a wave is in, in the tension field? Uh, no, I'm still trying to work at this out. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, be signing off now and just listen to the conference later then. Uh, which is, you know, we're talking about what is an intensity. So your, your field can have a time varying intensity. Now, I suppose you could just say that that's what you can measure on your voltmeter, and you can see it go up and down. 
or in your oscilloscope, you can see that going up and down. But fundamentally, it's a push and it's a pull. Because that's, uh, that's what's going on physically with the electrons in your, I don't know, like an oscilloscope. Fundamentally, if you were to look at that, what you're receiving on your electromagnetic wave is some kind of push and pull of the, uh, of the electrons in that wire. Well, well you're, 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 you're uh, it's displaying too much ignorance here. Let me talk a little bit more. Uh, in electrodynamics, there are two types of fields. There are transverse fields and longitudinal fields. Transverse fields have a velocity C when they're away from what we would call matter, but uh, longitudinal fields have a higher velocity. And the longitudinal fields, we make meters that do not use wires. You just, for instance, uh, your body, the molecules in your body uh, emit longitudinal radiation continuously. So if I want to measure the longitudinal fields of my body, if I approach the meter from a distance, as I approach closer and closer, it raises its... Not pointing the question of, you know, how can your field have a time-varying intensity without it having a, con a, a conception of a particulate density changing? I mean, that, in, in my mind, that is the most reasonable, actually the only way where you can get anything physical to have a time-varying intensity is by changing, altering a, some, a density of something in order for there to be a density, there must be a concept of particles. So you can represent particles per square meter so that you can have a change in density. You can have lots of particles, but they have different field properties and that causes them to have different densities. But I'm saying that the only way there can be a density or intensity difference is with something which is particulate because without the particles there's no way you can define a density well i'm just saying that uh like in the case of the uh longitudinal uh electromagnetic field uh measurements uh you can measure that and uh it uh is independent of particles and I would claim that, you know, you, how do you know that? How do you know that's independent of particles? Because I can measure it in any media I want, and I can measure it in, in what we call a vacuum, and I see no difference. And how do you I mean? That's the fundamental difference. I mean, the, the hypothesis is that that vacuum is actually chock full of matter, right? Right, but the matter has different properties and it would show up it doesn't show up with longitudinal radiation mm, well the, the, the claim here is that see we're, we're discussing the nature of fields and you're saying field can exist without a particulate medium and I'm saying no field I'm saying the field is this origin of all particulate matter Without the field, you can't have any matter. And I would say that that is also false. But that is in agreement with the experiments that Winston Bostick performed. You have yeah. no experiments going the other way. I would say that that's not really the conclusion. That, that's a conclusion. That conclusion actually is wrong. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you were to ask people like Maxwell or Faraday or Coulomb, what is charge? They would have to say, I don't know. It's a constant I associate with these fields. If you were to ask Newton or gravity, what is mass? He would say, I don't know, but I'm associating that with these fields that produce the force of gravity. Yeah, and that tells you that they don't know something, right? Right, and there's if you ask... When, when I derive the force of gravity from electrodynamics, I define mass. 
in terms of entirely electrodynamic parameters. And I have a superior version of the force of gravity. I can explain why we don't need dark matter and dark energy because that version of gravity works even on spiral galaxies and uh, on Pioneer 10 and 11 in our own solar system, etc. Whereas the oh. other theories of gravity, which have mass in them, which you that's, don't know what it is, they don't. That's all wonderful, but I, you know, I, I, but your, your, your theories have this gigantic hole that you can drive a truck through, which is that uh, you, you, you do not, you, you, it, it, it's not reasonable to say that, uh, that particles are not present in the, in, in the, in the formation of the phenomenon we call uh, electromagnetism. And so I, re I, I reject, reject the whole basis for, for that thinking. I especially reject the idea that uh, particles are somehow made out of waves. I mean, this, we've had a recent email discussion, and I'm trying to point out as strongly as possible that matter cannot be, is never destroyed, is not converted, is not equivalent to energy, right? What happens when an electron and a positron get together in an accelerator center? What happens is they come together like two marbles and they stick together. That's what happens. And they annihilate each other and we can't find the mass. No, we can't they, find the spin. We cannot find the magnetic properties. So they don't exist anymore. No, that is false. I believe that if you made a dedicated experiment to go look for, say, the kinetic energy of a joined positron electron, you would find it. You get the energy, but you don't, if your particle is still there, it has to have its properties. Yes, those properties are almost completely neutralized by the fact that positron electron almost completely neutralize each other. So yes, it's very difficult to find, but- we, we, can, we can make positronium, which is positron. a positron and an electron, and we can observe it, and we can... Positronium is not. Positronium is not a joined positron electron. Now, the other thing that people will say is, well, it's not hydrogen either. Of course it's not hydrogen. That's not a positron and an electron. A, a positron, positron and an electron has different mass than any other type of atom. It uh, has its own emission and absorption lines, spectral you, lines, and it not, has its own mass. And so... Not. Positronium is not the ether particle I'm proposing. Positronium is a joined positron and electron. Positronium is still a separate positron and electron. But it it, uh, it disappears anybody? after a while. Uh, and this my is question a, to you is so uh, why why is your why is your electron positron uh, not like the positronium when it d decays? Why doesn't it have exactly the same properties? Because that is what you get after the positronium decays. After the electron falls into the positron and they're just like two peas in a pod, that is my particle. It's not, the positronium still has one particle orbiting around the other. They're not physically joined. But why can't I put light in there and excite it to an excited level? You can, if you put uh, it up. I can't get the positronium excited levels that way unless I have produced a positronium. I mean, this is what's called pair production. If you put a Why are they even the positron and electron orbiting around each other? Why are they even orbiting? What's attracting them to each other to cause them to orbit? Well, that's obviously the electrostatic force. A force, a force field. field or a force it's particle? particle. You have the electrostatic force around the po the positron and the electron. Now, once again, oh, you, you have an electrostatic field around them. Interesting. Yes, they have a field around them because they're surrounded by the ether. Well, because they're made of the field. What? <laughs> Repeat that again. They are made of the field. They are geometries of the field. How are you? 
Uh, they are not put around our geometries of the field. No, I don't think they're geometries of the field. Well, you don't think they're geometries of the field, but that's just it. It's a, a matter of opinion, not a matter of a measurement, not a matter of fact. It's because, a matter of opinion. Because a field is something which supports some physical phenomenon. They are not. You have an opinion. A posit, a posit electron C exists, but it's an opinion. Well, the thing is, I, I just had a discussion with Lou about what's an opinion in science. Now, an opinion would be like whether you like a movie or not. And certainly there's no right or wrong answer to that. But when it comes to science, I mean, we are seeking the ultimate truth. Now, ultimately, but, there is a correct answer to this question of how electromagnetic fields propagate. It's not going to be a matter of opinion. But if Bill can take the field and derive from the field mathematical equations and gra diagrams of how gravity is generated, how the particles, electron, positron, nature comes about, and, and uh, how magnetic fields come about from that one simple beginning of a simple electromagnetic field, then that is a sequence that can be followed. You, you, you have to have it all has to tie together. And that's what Bill has done. He's taken a very fundamental, the most fundamental thing, which is the field. And he, from that, can derive, the, through the geometries of the field, he can derive the properties of gravity. He can derive the properties of an electron, oh, the properties of a neutron. Wonderful. And that's great. But if you can't explain the nature of the field itself, then you're building a castle in the sky. It describe the nature of the field itself. The nature of the field is the tension field. It has, it, it, it supports tension. And the only things that I can think of that can support tension are made of particulate matter. Uh, and then you have to think a little longer. Uh, no, I don't. This is the way we, this is how we use definitions. This is how we know what tension is. It's made if out you, of if you do a, matter. <laughs> if you do a tug of war and you pull on either end of the rope, you increase, increase, increase the tension. If you pull on one end of the rope, the tension travels down that rope to the other end of that rope and, the, and increases the tension on that rope. The tension travels as a wave. You're talking about a guitar string earlier or a violin string. Pull the string. Don't just vibrate it sideways and utilize its mass. Pull the string and utilize its tension to propagate the tension from one end to the other. Realize that the tension is communicated between the particles, which are all created of, of tension field. Everything is basically created from the tension field. All of those things are made out of particulate matter. All of those things are made of tension fields that are in the shape of, in geometries of, things that behave like particles. No, none of those things are of, of, of tension fields. Those things are all made out of particulate matter. I, I've given you the opinion, Bill's given you the opinion, and I think uh, you'll just have to think about it longer, and you can decide to stick with yours, or you can move on uh whichever but you know we could uh, we can't continue to go round and round in circles well i'm still trying to convince you i mean this is a debate you know this is like like sparring well you you won't simply won't convince me that that's <laughs> that's a given won't I'm convince perfect. that that space is made out of something I will not convince you that you will not convince me that space is filled with the particular matter. There is no need for it. If there's well, a simple suppose, answer and it works, there is absolutely no reason to make it complex. Well, why is that complex? I mean, I think that What's, simplifies things. I think if because you, you have to have electron positrons that had to come from somewhere, and because the electron positrons do not simply attract each other, they have to have a field. Because the electron positrons can't be bumping up next together, next to each other, and create a force that actually actuates in a straight line. Because if you take a kid's playpen full of balls and you try to pull on one ball, and you see if that ball on the far end of that playpen actually comes towards that ball, there's no tension between them. Well, I mean, you can make. You're saying, that, you're saying there's tension between the electron and positron, but there's a field between an electron and a positron, and that's because the electron and positron themselves are made of those fields, and they are just concentrations of the tension density of that field. No, see, that does not that that's not. Yeah. Really 
Well, that's not reasonable to me because, you know, tensions... It's like apples and oranges, really. I mean, tension no, is... Not like apples and oranges. It's like tension. And I give you experiments. We've given, been given experiments long ago about how to, how to study attention. And you've never studied tension. You've never studied the behavior of tension. And once you study the behavior of tension and you expand that tension to wave patterns and the tension between wave patterns, you will no longer say waves just travel through each other. Waves can interact. Waves can strengthen each other. Waves can weaken each other. Waves can redirect each other. Waves can become focused to particles like properties. And waves, can, waves are in a tension field are what things are made of. And, but you need to understand how tension propagates in a field and how tension is the source of all ten, of all particles. Now, the and only that, the only thing get, that I need to understand, Franklin. the only thing I need to understand is that all wave phenom all wave phenomenon must be based upon particles. And at that point, we're, we're pretty much you know done discussing. Because last time you discussed about, oh, yeah, you can have tension and you can't have transverse waves in a solid. Transverse waves cannot go. But all of a sudden, a bread spring type framework, if you, if you just jiggle that up and down, oh, wow, look at you've got a transverse wave. And so, you know, you think long enough, you will finally get to where that you don't need anything but the tension to create the waves. And you'll get there eventually, Franklin, and you'll eventually drop no. your electron positron. But if you don't, that's fine, too. That, this is my point, which is that I, you know, you, you, you cannot get there. Anytime that you have a wave phenomenon, the only way that can possibly be propagated is through a change in density. And the only way you can have any concept of density is if you can measure number of particles per square area. Tension is not density. That requires tension is not based on density. Pressure is dense based on density. Tension is not density. Tension is strength. Tensile strength. Yes, and when you pull things apart, the only reason you can tell that there's a difference in the untensioned versus the tensioned state is the space between the atoms of whatever you're tensioning. So that is, once again, a density. There can be no concept of tension without a change in density of some material. No, you just have to, you're just saying that the tension has to be between two points and you're identifying those two points as something material. The tension is between the points that you're in. The, the points are, are you're, you're stuck on the fact that it's a material wor world and it's not, a, it's an electromagnetic world. And the tension between it is electromagnetic, just like the tension between the Earth and the Sun is, is electromagnetic. It's actually gravitational, but it's in the electromagnetic field, as Bill calls it. I just call it the energy field because, to me, electromagnetics is transverse and gravity is, prop is longitudinal. But that's just a small distinction between the way Bill and I describe the field. All right. Well, uh, we've been well lo looking at the electrodynamic um, analogy, um, we, we could conceive that the permittivity is independent of the permeability. I, I, I mean, it, it isn't a function of it. They're two independent variables. Uh, and therefore, if the analogy holds, the tension and the density should be um, independent. The, the tension shouldn't depend upon the density. But, um, you know, I, I think it, it might be worth just recalling as well that <clears throat> just as for... Um, uh, matter, you you can you can actually um, ascribe matter waves, and and you can ascribe um, a wavelength to to to, to matter. Well, in the same way, you can ascribe um, a mass to radiation. Uh, you you can do that. You know, it, it's done obviously in the quantum theory, but it, it actually can be calculated what 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 the uh, what the mass of of radiation is. So. You know, to a certain extent, there, there, there are different sides of the same coin. And, you know, I've, I've heard these arguments before and you're going on and on and on. And I don't think you'll ever uh, reach a conclusion because it's really a, a philosophical uh, discussion. It, it, it's, it's a little akin to uh, which came first, the chicken or, or egg. And um, 
I, I know if, if you feel very strongly on one side or the other, you'll say, well, I'm dismissing it a bit. But I think to a certain extent, um, you might both be right. And, and they, they might really be just different sides of the same coin, which are uh, visible um, in different ways at, at different times. And looking for one to be more fundamental than the other is possibly um, in vain. Anyway, that, 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 that's, that's my just two cents work. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I kind of disagree with the idea that they're looking at it in two different ways, but uh, the uh, because uh, you're basically when you're talking density, you're talking again like as if there were the carrier were a fluid-like substance, and uh, if it's a solid-like substance that has no particular characteristics, there can really be no density because there is no particular particulates to get closer or farther away. The only thing there can be is the strength of the field or tension within the field. And uh, I think Einstein even said it in his 1920 paper that you know there are there is uh, nothing, no distinguishable movable parts within this field. And I think his description of the field of what he described as ether is a fairly good description of the with what the field is. And I, I think that as, as the opposing viewpoint, so let's First of all, let's get the two viewpoints in, in clear focus. So one is that the field is basically fundamental and that it doesn't have to be made out of particles. It just kind of exists and it can exhibit these, uh, I don't know, intensity differences, tension differences without the presence of any physical medium being present. So is that correct, Cornelius? That is your... That the, only, the only thing the field exhibits is tension variations. Okay. No motion. No motion. Just the only motion is the motion of the di tension very di density tension variations between between areas. Now the opposing viewpoint, which I'm presenting, which is that I believe, and I want to make sure I'm not saying that fields don't exist. What I'm doing is that I'm taking your idea of field and saying, okay, the field itself is actually made out of a particulate medium. You know, I'm saying that that what we see as electromagnetic field is made out of this positive electron C, which exists. So actually, that theory can exist in 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 coexistence with everything you're saying. Other than I'm saying that the field is not something mysterious. The field is made out of physical substance. I'm just taking your explanation. I'm filling in the castle in the sky that you've built by saying that the field, the electromagnetic field, consists of a medium like air. And I'm telling you exactly what it's made out of, which is these positron electron dipoles. And that I'm telling you things like charge are just waves in that field. So like the positive charge is just a particular uh, high frequency EM wave coming out of an electron and uh, the, 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 the positive, the, the negative, or the difference between the positive and negative field is that the, it's just still the same EM wave, it's just a different phase. So, right, well, okay. So that right. what we think the negative field is just actually waves in a positive electron C. Yeah, well, it, it's close, it just don't need a positive electron C because first off, like Dale, Bill said earlier, there's no structure to the field. And your positive electron field automatically is putting in a structure that should be identifiable as a unique structure. And uh, you can't just have the mass of the electron positron disappear just because you choose to have it disappear because they're tightly bonded to each other. You, you, you have to be explained, able to explain what mass is. And we, you know, Bill and I can, I think, both demonstrate what the wave structure of, of a uh, charge is. And I think Bill has described his wave structure of a charge as a soliton pattern of waves circling around, or of a wave traveling around a soliton of a particular wavelength that matches up with itself. I have a slightly different wave pattern that the creates that. Or actually the theories is that the, your theories don't describe exactly how charge works at any time. 
Uh, they would if you would uh, if you if uh, if you follow it through. But you know, first you need you need to understand is how the tension wave works because it all is based on tension waves. Charge is actually like a third step in there. The first thing you have to come up with was is gravitation. The second thing you have to come up with is mass. And once you finally got mass, then upon the mass you can build a charge because all charges have mass existing with them except for the electromagnetic wave, which is a constant non-moving non-static charge. It's a moving charge. So. All right. Well, I'm going to give Bill the uh, the closing statement there. So, uh, Bill, what do you think of my assertion that I'm just explaining what the field is made out of? I think there are some uh, bigger issues here that uh, we just alluded to briefly, and that is... Uh, uh, we would like in science to know where did everything come from? <laughs> you know, like uh, the current uh, politically correct theory is the Big Bang. And uh, before the Big Bang, there was nothing. No uh, uh, medium, no uh, ether, uh, nothing. And uh, then you, you got all this stuff. And... Uh, so that's uh, what's called a naturalistic uh, view. And the uh, other view that comes from primarily the Judeo-Christian background is that uh, uh, God was the origin of the field and he produces the ripples or changes in the field that create uh, solitons from which all matter is made. And... Uh, so that's how he can be both the creator and the sustainer of the universe. But if you, you've, so you've got these two different views that you've got a, uh, that are opposing one another, uh, the naturalistic view and the kind of the religious view. And uh, so that, that's one origin. Uh, many of the founders of electrodynamics were Christians from the Judeo-Christian background. And they followed that view. That's why they called the field the spirit of God, because that was what they thought was the proper term from the Bible for, for field. And uh, the, uh, uh, but we have naturalism uh, took control, uh, political control, the scientific uh, uh, enterprise uh, starting around. 1910, 1900, somewhere in that range. And they, they just removed these ideas from all the uh, textbooks and colleges, universities, and that sort of thing. But if you look at the older publications, like I have copies of Encyclopedia Britannica from the, before 1900, and they explain these things very nicely. But unfortunately, most libraries don't have that. They have a more current version of the, of the encyclopedia. But... On the internet, you can uh, purchase scanned copies of some of these books and uh, get get a copy that way. Um, well, uh, we're kind of getting to the top of the hour here, and yeah. uh, I know you kind of like getting into these history lessons, but we we are running out of time. So, so anyway, I, I, we have that involved in our various approaches too, and uh, so, uh, but the real. Uh, uh, Thing, if you apply the uh, principle of simplicity, which approach can explain all the phenomena that science is investigating? And so that is, uh, so in the approach that I've taken, uh, I explain uh, all the forces in nature, and I show an improved version of every one, improved version of electrodynamics, improved version of force of gravity, improved version of the force of inertia and I show in my book that the force the strong interaction force holding the nucleus together and the weak interaction force governing beta decay no longer are supported by the empirical data that NIST has measured it the empirical data of nuclear isotopes to eight significant figures and now we can rule out these forces from within the nucleus it's not popular to say that. You may get fired if you're any, working at a university for pointing that out, but uh, that is the case. And so, so we've got that, those forces. And then, can I interrupt, Bill? 
because once again, we're kind of getting towards right, the top. Right, right. So anyway, what I'm saying, uh, uh, I mean, each of us has to do this. We have uh, to be able to explain that. We have to be able to explain the w working of the atom. Well, you and haven't. The you current didn't. theory of the atom has been falsified. The, the Dirac and the Schrodinger model of the atom and the Bohr model has been falsified and other theories such as the one my son did for the International Science Fair, which won him a few hundred thousand dollar prize, uh, that uh, one explains in terms of the well, electron I, consisting of three solitons, that explains the- I hate uh, to interrupt you, so, Bill. Yeah, but, so, uh, so anyway, what I'm saying is these other approaches have to answer all these questions. Theory of the nucleus, I, well, I was of elementary particles, theory of the atom, and what is the origin of life? Totally so true. you're going to have to handle all those things. And uh, I've already made progress in each one of those areas, but you are uh, free to try to match that. Well, I mean, I was, you didn't answer my question. I mean, do you remember what my original question was? What was my question? Well, you want, you're, you're emphasizing particles over fields. And what uh, what we're saying is that everything is measured in terms of fields, not particles. What was my question? See, my question was, do you think that I have found an origin for your fields? The, uh, the answer is that it doesn't agree with experiment, your your ideas. Uh, the fields seem to be the origin of particles and charge, not the other way around. All right, well, I guess that would be the main controversy. Are particles made out of waves or are maybe waves made out of particles? So I think that would be the way to conclude it. So uh, let's summarize today. So uh, today's uh, conversation was kicked off by Harry Ricker, who was wondering, what happened to the ether? There seemed to be a perfectly sensible explanation that there was something like the air between radio transmitters and receivers. And uh, somehow that whole idea uh, got disregarded. So we started looking into perhaps what the causes of that. Uh, I found a paper on what happened to the old ether. And part of it was uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment saying there's no ether. Then there was Einstein who was saying that the ether was superfluous. And then there was quantum physics that said that electromagnetic photons travel as particles which don't require a medium. So perhaps all of those are to blame. And anyone who brings up the word ether is guaranteed to get fired if they are in a mainstream uh, scientific establishment we have established. Um, but then we kind of got into the question of, well, what, what is the ether? And so we have uh, Bill and uh, Cornelius who are strongly advocating for, these, for these, the standpoint that the field itself is fundamental and that particles like electrons or whatnot are actually made out of this field. So uh, Cornelius tends to call it uh, tension. And so particles arise as a function of uh, tension in the field. And uh, Bill also thinks that uh, the things like electrons arise as basically standing waves within the field. And of course, this highly contrasts with my almost opposite viewpoint, which is that all waves must uh, be composed of a particulate medium. So for me, the particle is fundamental. So, and I would say that, you know, we can see particles, we can see grains of sand, uh, we can see atoms, we can clearly see that particles exist. So I think there's no problem with using that as something that we think fundamentally exists because we see those things. And so I can definitely build waves out of particles. So because I can see definitely, I can build waves out of particles, but I can't definitely see building particles out of waves, I would say that the direction of going from particles to waves is something that sounds more reasonable to me. But that is the crux of the debate, which is whether, you know, things like electrons are made out of things like waves or whether electrons themselves 
are just the fundamental thing that we see in the world. So that's an interesting debate. It's things for us to think about. And, um, and that's what we're here for. We're here to, to debate opposing viewpoints because it would be really boring if we all thought the same thing. So um, that will be uh, this week's conclusion of our discussion. And I thank everyone for coming and participating. And uh, hope to see you next week. All right. Thanks.